morning, everyone. It's Mark Crowther, Chair of the Department. We'll just give people a few minutes to uh, join here. Uh, we are going to uh, use the webinar function, so it just takes a second to connect people in. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mark Crowther, Chair of the Department. Uh, welcome to the last of the Chair's Grand Rounds for uh, this year. Uh, again, just a reminder, we are using the webinar function in Zoom, which means that um, your uh, chat function is turned off. If you have a question, please type it into the question and answer box and uh, we will address as many as we possibly can at the end. Uh, also, uh, please remember that these will be or are being recorded and, and they will be available through the Department of Medicine's YouTube channel at some point over the next uh, few days. Uh, two uh, business items before we get started. The first is uh, to um, uh, just remind everybody that June 3rd, uh, 2020 uh, was the date when Dr. Clive Kieran died. Uh, many of you will know that Clive was a long-standing member of the department, uh, did research in my personal area, but had a very large footprint in our educational uh, domain, leading the clinician inve investigator program for a very long time. And Clive's uh, passing was a major landmark event for the Department of Medicine, uh, which occurred in the middle of the, um, of the COVID-19 epidemic. And as a result of that, many people will have missed that landmark event. You will see over the next couple of weeks that the department has decided to do some fundraising for an endowed chair in Clive's name. And so please keep an eye out for that. Um, and for some of you, I will be reaching out you, to you individually to see if you'd be willing to contribute to this, uh, this project. Uh, thank you uh, for spending a bit of time thinking about that. Uh, today's speaker is known to everybody. Dr. Paul O'Byrne is the Dean and Vice President of McMaster University. Uh, I was trying to think of something to say to, about Paul that some people might not know. I think everybody knows that Paul has been you know, the, the most prominent administrator in the Department of Medicine, followed by in the deanery for the last 20 years at McMaster uh, University and has led us through all kinds of good and bad times and has really overseen the growth and development of both the department and the faculty. Paul um, has led us ably through the COVID thing. And, and although some of you may perceive that the university's response to COVID has been a little bit discombobulated. In fact, once you actually see the inner workings, it has been extraordinarily discombobulated. And I know that Paul has spent a lot of time trying to hammer some sense into some of the people on main campus when they have ideas which seem appropriate to them but are wildly difficult for us to implement like giving administrative staff random days off. Uh, an anecdote about Paul that some of you may not know is that um, you know, as we enter a, a year with an internal review for our internal medicine residency program and then an external review next year, um, that uh, Paul was actually once a very strong advocate for residents and in fact uh, in the 1970s I think led the only strike that the uh, professional association of then interns and residents of Ontario led against uh, the faculties of medicine across Ontario and so he has a background in political activism but I suspect as many people do he moved from left to right as he aged which seems to be a common observation in people as they as they age. So uh, in addition to everything that people know about Paul, I think one thing people don't realize is he's a very prominent researcher, one of the, if not the preeminent researcher in asthma in the world and has maintained a very large research footprint despite being an administrator and doing an immense amount of administrative work over the last 20 years. And today Paul's going to uh, do a presentation which I've previously seen, which was a real tour de force examining uh, how asthma therapy has changed and some of the really big news over the last couple of years in, in asthma therapy that Paul has personally led despite all of his other trials and tribulations. So uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Paul O'Byrne. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, very, very kind and generous introduction. I'm going to share my screen um, to uh, get things underway. Uh, just take me one brief moment. Very good. So. Uh, thank you again uh, for the introduction, for the opportunity of joining uh, the final chairs, round, chairs grand rounds of the of the academic year. And uh, this morning, I will be speaking about some uh, very new uh, and I think quite important changes in the way that we've been considering the management of asthma uh, over the past uh, couple of years. And the title is Con "New Concepts in Preventing Asthma Exacerbations." And of course, important that I share with you my potential for conflict of interest with advisory boards, speakers fees, uh, grants in aid that I hold, of course, uh, here at Mac uh, as my employer. I'm going to begin uh, this morning with uh, 
this slide, which is an overview of a very recently published summary of the uh, uh, asthma management recommendations for the treatment of asthma in children and in adults. And this was published about uh, six weeks ago. And it has two uh, major changes when compared to the last iteration of the uh, summer of the guidelines that were published. The first of these is to uh, add the, uh, the evaluation of risk of severe exacerbations of asthma into the recommendations of what is regularly assessed uh, when patient is seen uh, for review. And in fact, I have to say that when I see patients in clinic, uh, this is the very first question I ask the patient, have you had a severe exacerbation or an event that required oral corticosteroids in the past three or six months or how, however frequent the visit has been? And the second new change, which is really a sea change in asthma management, is the recommendation that for patients uh, using a reliever inhaler, which every asthmatic needs to have available, that the combination of budesonide for motorol, which is a rapid onset, uh, long acting beta agonist for motorol, plus uh, an inhaled corticosteroid budesonide, be considered as the relief medication rather than a short acting beta agonist, which we've had uh, in one form or another for more than 100 years as the reliever medication used for asthma. And this change, I think, is an important change, and I'm going to discuss with you this morning the evidence why both of these changes have been made in this, uh, in this um, most recent iteration of the, uh, of the guidelines. Now, why asthma exacerbations? Well, the first reason is that um, asthma exacerbations are very common events, even in patients who are considered to have mild asthma. And I'm going to share with you a bit of evidence in a couple of minutes to support this statement. They are, of course, the period of greatest risk to asthmatic patients. They are the greatest cause of anxiety to patients as well as to their families. It's the greatest stress to the healthcare professionals when managing these acute severe events in the emergency room or in a, an intensive care setting. And finally, managing acute severe exacerbations is the greatest cost to the healthcare system for management of asthma. And so I would posit that Severe exacerbations are the most important asthma risk and therefore the most important treatment target that we must consider when making decisions around treatment options for patients with asthma. And these exacerbations have consequences. The most profound, of course, is asthma mortality. And there are patients in Canada every year who die of acute severe asthma. Of course, emergency visits, hospitalization, ICU admissions, missing school or missing work, the disruption to the family when a child, for example, is admitted to hospital or an emergency room, parents taking time off work, the anxiety generated with the acute illness in the child, the need for additional medications when the uh, exacerbation has occurred. And finally, evidence which uh, has existed now for about 10 years from a study that I was involved with some years ago that exacerbations do have long-term effects on lung function and are certainly one of the causes in asthma why, asthma why asthmatic patients have and can have fixed irreversible airflow obstruction. Now to show this slide again, to make a different point, the construction of this slide is done very deliberately to indicate that the majority of patients, the vast majority of patients, maybe as high as 70 to 80 percent of patients with asthma have mild to mild to moderate disease and can be managed with inhaled corticosteroids as their only treatment option used as a maintenance therapy. And that recommendation even exists down this end of this continuum, which is meant to represent the patients with the most mild asthma with very intermittent symptoms. And then, of course, if inhaled corticosteroids alone are not sufficient, the recommendation is to add a long-acting inhaled beta-2 agonist to the steroid 
being delivered from the same inhaler. So how good is the evidence that recommending inhaled corticosteroids in extremely mild asthma really does have benefit? The best evidence comes from this study that was published in The Lancet a few years ago by Helen Riddell and myself and some colleagues from various countries that looked at a retrospective analysis of a very large study called the START study. The START study was a study of more than 7,000 patients with very, very mild asthma, newly diagnosed with the diagnosis within the year prior to entry into the trial, who were then followed for three years, treatment with either placebo once daily as a maintenance or budesonide, a very low dose once daily as a maintenance treatment. This analysis evaluated uh, those patients who entered into the trial with very, very infrequent symptoms, zero to one symptom days per week, greater than one, but two or less, so one to two days per week, or more than two days per week. And it looked at the risk of a, what is called here a severe asthma-related event. This is an event that required the patient to be hospitalized or at least visiting an emergency room for the management of acute severe asthma. And over the three years of the study, the patients treated with placebo, about 5% of these extremely mild patients uh, had a, such a severe event requiring a hospital admission. And in those having more than two symptom days per week, it was about 8%. And there was a 40 to about 50, 45% risk reduction when patients were treated with once daily low dose budesonide when compared to placebo. Now, this is perhaps even a bit more obvious when we looked at severe exacerbations, but which did not require a hospital visit. So these were exacerbations managed as an outpatient, in an outpatient setting. Uh, treated with oral corticosteroids, usually uh, prednisone for seven to 10 days. And in these patients, again, to stress with extremely, the mildest asthma you could possibly find, about there were about 200 uh, a person uh, per 100 person year. So about 20% of these patients on placebo had a severe exacerbation, and that was fairly consistent across these uh, three uh, subcategories. And again, the risk reduction was somewhere between 40, 35 to about 50% when patients were treated with just once daily low dose budesonide. So the messages from this analysis were first of all, severe exacerbations requiring systemic corticosteroids, oral corticosteroids are common. About 20% of these patients in any year had a severe event and very low doses of inhaled steroids reduce that risk by 40 to 50 percent. And that's the evidence that's being used by the Canadian recommendations to suggest that even patients with very infrequent symptoms are firstly are at risk of a severe event, and this risk can be mitigated by using very low once daily uh, inhaled steroid doses. Now the problem with using this approach is this. Asthmatic patients, I think like patients treated for many chronic diseases, particularly those that are asymptomatic like hypertension, adherence to maintenance treatment is appalling. And I use this, what I call the Fitzgerald rule. It's a, a rule I first heard from my professor of pharmacology when I was at medical school, Professor Fitzgerald, who said that in, in most chronic diseases, patients will take about 50% of their medication 50% of patients will take about 50% of their medication about 50% of the time. So if you do the math, that would suggest that maybe 12 to 15% of patients actually take the regular maintenance treatment once daily in this case, as we, would, as we would suggest. Well, it turns out that Professor Fitzgerald was an optimist because when you actually evaluate this formally, it's even not that good. And a study I like to show to make this point because it's graphically very nicely shown. In a study of around 5,500 patients with asthma who were followed in a health maintenance organization in California and treated with a very effective combination inhaler with an inhaled steroid, fluticasone, and the long-acting inhaled beta-2 agonist, salmeterol. 
To enter into the study, every patient had to fill the first prescription they received. So that's 100%. At the end of one month, this had dropped for the repeat prescription to about 40%. And at the end of one year, it was about 10% of patients had filled the prescription repeatedly to take this medication twice daily as recommended. Now the risk of discontinuation over the one year was higher in patients who were younger, perhaps not terribly surprising. In females, that I must confess was surprising to me. In patients who had previously used a short acting beta agonist, if there was no other drug used, and of course in the United States where a payment can be an issue, higher copayment increased the risk of discontinuation. Now there are lots of other reasons for poorly controlled asthma. Uh, all sorts of comorbidities are associated with, uh, with, 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 poor, with poor control. Smoking is sadly about as prevalent in asthmatics as non-asthmatics, and smoking has been clearly shown to reduce the efficacy of inhaled corticosteroids. Psychopathology, persistent allergen or occupational exposure, incorrect diagnosis, and finally, in maybe 5 to 8% of patients, severe refractory disease. Now, because of the issue with adherence to maintenance inhaled corticosteroids, what most patients do, particularly those with milder asthma, is only rely on their reliever medication, which for asthmatics uh, has only been a short-acting inhaled beta-2 agonist. This is the classical blue puffer that you see asthmatics taking out and using either before exercise or when they're having symptoms. And inhaled beta-2 agonist sales have steadily inexorably increased uh, over time. This is between 2008 and 2019. Now, of course, this is not all for asthma. This is also in patients with COPD, but sales of a short acting beta agonist have steadily increased. And this is despite the fact that in asthma, we have known for a very, very long time, more than four decades, that the use of a short acting beta agonist uh, to manage asthma as the only treatment puts patients at risk, particularly of severe exacerbation. So this is a more recent analysis published in 2020 of a very large uh, series of studies called the Sabina studies that looks at the prescription and the um, dis uh, dispensing of short acting beta agonists and associated with subsequent risks in patients. And in this study, it's several hundred thousand patients were evaluated. And so they, uh, they uh, dichotomized the patient population into those who used two or less canisters of asaba in, any, in, in a year, compared to those who use more than three, uh, uh, three or more canisters in a year. And for those with very mild asthma, step one, more moderate, moderate to severe, and finally severe disease. And the risk of a severe exacerbation in the subsequent year is shown here with um, less than or two or less canisters uh, uh, being the, uh, the comparator. There was an increase in all severities of asthma, which ranged from about an 18% increase to almost 50% increased risk of a severe exacerbation. Even more concerning in this study, they evaluated mortality or cause mortality asthma-related mortality or uh, respiratory-related mortality. And now they have they divided the population up to those who used two or less canisters in a year three to five, six to 10, and more than 11. And for all cause mortality, there was a dose response with increased risk of mortality with a more, than, uh, a two, more than doubling of the risk. And for asthma-related mortality, the risk was increased by more than 30-fold for those using more than 11 canisters per year. Now, of course, the problem with these sorts of analyses is uh, assuming cause and effect. We don't know whether this increased use of a SABA, a short acting beta agonist, is causing this, or is the fact that these are more severe asthmatics anyway, therefore more symptomatic, and therefore at higher risk of, a, of, of, of an asthma death. But the evidence that we have accumulated over many years would suggest that there is indeed a cause effect relationship. I'm going to show you one study. It's an older study that uh, my colleague uh, 
uh, uh, Gail Gavreau uh, completed as part of her, uh, her graduate thesis work, which looked at treatment with a placebo or a Saba albuterol salbutamol. And the treatment was only for one week where the treatment was administered four times a day, which would be uh, way back uh, in these, uh, these days would be considered fairly standard use. And following treatment, the patients washed out for 12 hours and then were given an inhaled allergen to which they develop acute responses, early phase responses shown here. And then this partially recovers and then a delayed response occurring between three and four hours, which can progress over seven hours. And if, on, if left untreated, can actually worsen up to 12 to 24 hours and can be even more profound than the early response. Importantly, when the patients were treated with albuterol just for one week, the magnitude of this bronchoconstrictor response was significantly enhanced. And that was associated with a significant increase in the trafficking of eosinophils, the inflammatory cell associated with these uh, allergic responses into the airway, an increase in sputum eosinophils following treatment with salbutamol when compared to placebo. So just one week of treatment with the Saba can actually increase the airway inflammation associated with, uh, with an allergen exposure, as well as the magnitude of the bronchoconstrictor response. So this does suggest that the use of regular Sabas is not benign. It does have consequences that at least one could uh, extrapolate or would, would put patients at risk of severe exacerbations or even death under the right circumstances. So to summarize this, SABAs used for symptom relief remain in 2021 the most widely used asthma medications worldwide. Regular use of SABAs has been shown to worsen asthma control, a study that Malcolm Sears, our colleague here in Hamilton, published in 1990, actually enhance or make exercise bronchoconstriction worse. Study from Mark Inman uh, uh, when he was working in the lab some years ago, and I've shown you the evidence that Gail Garreau had for promoting airway inflammation. And that overuse is associated with increased asthma mortality. So, so asthmatics do require a reliever medication. They need something that they can rely on, which will rapidly relieve symptoms when they occur. And so the question that I'm posing, is there any benefit to using a reliever which not only has a rapid onset beta agonist to relieve bronchoconstriction, but also contains an inhaled corticosteroid? And the answer to the question is absolutely yes. And to make the point, I'm going to show you one study and then show you a meta-analysis of a number of studies that have addressed this question. But initially the question was posed in patients who have moderate to severe asthma who require the use of an ICS long-acting beta agonist combination as their maintenance treatment. So this study, this was the STAY study, uh, evaluated uh, a little under um, 3,000 patients, randomly allocated for one year to a higher dose of inhaled steroid, budesonide, uh, 320 micrograms twice daily, but with a SABA as the uh, reliever medication. And compared that to a lower dose, this is one quarter of the steroid dose, of the ICS combination, and again with the short acting beta agonist as reliever. But the third arm of the study did something different. It used this maintenance treatment, which was the same uh, one quarter of the dose of the higher dose inhale, uh, uh, inhaled steroid, but, all, but not only used that as a maintenance, but also one puff anytime uh, as needed as a reliever medication. And the primary outcome variable in the study were severe asthma exacerbations. And this slide is, summarizes every single event that occurred during the one year of the study. Each exacerbation is shown as a line. The length of the line is the number of days that the patient was on oral corticosteroids to manage the severe exacerbation. The first exacerbation is shown on top and any second or third is shown below. So with the higher dose inhaled steroid with Saba as reliever, there were 294 events. With the lower dose steroid plus Fomotrol as maintenance and Saba as reliever, there were 330 events. But just switching the reliever medication from a, a short acting beta agonist to this combination 
uh, both as a maintenance and reliever, reduced the exacerbation risk, sorry, the exacerbation number to 160. So about a roughly 50% risk reduction just by switching the reliever to one which had an inhaled steroid. And Sobarajero et al. a couple of years ago did a, a reported a meta-analysis in JAMA of all of the studies. Uh, firstly, uh, when the comparator was the same maintenance dose of inhaled corticosteroid and LABA, showing that this approach was favored with about a 30% risk reduction overall. And that was even true when the comparator was a higher maintenance dose ICS LABA, where there was about a 20% uh, or 22% risk reduction of a severe exacerbation, just by having the reliever containing an inhaled corticosteroid. Now I've talked already a fair bit about milder asthma and the challenges with uh, using maintenance low dose inhaled steroids of mild asthma. And so the first study looking at this approach in milder asthmatic patients was reported by Alberto Papi and his colleagues in the New England Journal in 2007. And they uh, did a study, it wasn't a very large study, uh, but was the first study to compare as needed salbutamol or Ventolin uh, albuterol in the United States, compared to an as needed combination which contained albuterol, but also the inhaled corticosteroid beclomethazone. Interestingly, this was an old combination that was in a meter dose inhaler in the early 80s, but didn't get much traction and therefore wasn't uh, widely used and was discontinued until it was resurrected uh, to be part of this study. They also had two other treatment arms where they had patients on regular inhaled steroid beclomethazone with the Saba as reliever or regular combination therapy with the Saba as reliever. And the primary outcome variable was the uh, risk of a severe asthma exacerbation. And you can see the time to first severe exacerbation was shortest with the albuterol therapy and the as needed combination was not different to beclomethazone. And so that's shown in this summary. The reliever use was higher with as needed albuterol compared to, to beclomethazone maintenance. And this risk reduction uh, of using the as needed combination was achieved at about 24% of the dose of inhaled corticosteroids with either of the two maintenance uh, treatment arms. This study, however, was not large enough, or in fact, did not have mild enough patients to really impact the uh, treatment recommendations I've shown you uh, or, or get approval in any country for the use of this approach for the management of mild asthma. And so that led to the development of two much larger studies. Uh, they're called the SIGMA trials. And I'm going to briefly show you the design of each study because I'll be speaking about these for the next uh, few minutes. The first study was uh, SIGMA-1, had 3,800 patients randomly allocated to one of three treatment arms for a treatment period of one year. These were patients very, very carefully selected to have, to have mild intermittent asthma, the type of patient I already showed you in the STAR trial with very infrequent symptoms, but for whom there is good evidence that low doses of inhaled steroids uh, would provide benefit. And so the first treatment arm is what I'm going to call the, uh, the previous gold standard of treatment, budesonide twice daily with the Saba as needed. That was then compared to what the patients actually do, which is not use the budesonide, only use the Saba as needed. But of course, in this arm, there was a placebo as a maintenance treatment. And finally, the third treatment arm had a combination containing a steroid with fomoterol uh, as needed, again, with placebo as maintenance. This study was a very... Uh, carefully done study, I think, with lots of measurements made, electronic monitoring of symptoms measured every day. There were electronic monitoring of peak flows, measurement of, of lung function made twice a day, and reminders sent to patients twice a day to use their maintenance treatment. The second SIGMA trial was a little different. It was a bit more pragmatic in design, slightly larger, 4,200 patients only had two treatment arms, which was the maintenance budesonide with the Saba compared to the budesonide from Motorol uh, as needed. So it did not have a tributylene only uh, treatment arm. 
There were only two mid-trial visits. There were no daily diary. There was no monitoring of peak flow and there were no medication reminders uh, sent to the patients. Baseline demographics uh, for the two studies, Sigma-1 and Sigma-2, were essentially identical in every aspect. But I want to share with you this slide for two reasons. Firstly, to make the point that to get into the study, patients could enter the study either on controlled on a Saba only. These were people who had symptoms more than two days per week uh, while taking only a short acting beta agonist. And this made up about 44 to 45% of the, of the patient population. The second group of patients entered were controlled on inhaled corticosteroids or a leukotriene receptor antagonist. Uh, and that made up about 55% of the patient population. The second point is that as I tried to stress to you earlier, in the year prior to the entry into the study, about 20% of these patients had had a severe exacerbation requiring oral corticosteroids or a, an emergency room visit. To stress the point again that, mild, that severe exacerbations are not all that infrequent, even in patients considered to have a very mild asthma. And for the Sigma-1 trial, the primary outcome variable was the percentage of well-controlled asthma weeks. Now, honestly, this would not have been the primary outcome variable I would have chosen if I had to make these decisions. It was the one I argued for, but the regulatory authorities in Europe uh, who were giving advice about doing this study wanted a what they called a patient-centered outcome as the primary variable. I argued that severe exacerbations was the most patient-centric outcome, but didn't win that argument. So well-controlled asthma weeks, which was a week, that was completely, absolutely controlled. No symptoms, no reliever medication use, normal lung function, uh, just a perfectly normal week for a patient. And for the patients taking tibutylene only, which is the blue bar, 31% of the weeks were well controlled compared to 34% when the reliever was a uh, ICS lava combination. And that difference was statistically significant, which was really important because that allowed subsequent analysis of all of the secondary variables. And for patients taking the maintenance inhaled corticosteroid, 44% of the weeks were well controlled. And that difference was significantly better than either of the two treatment arms. So emphasizing that for asthma control, maintenance inhaled corticosteroids twice daily does give you the best outcome, consistent with, with many, many, many years and many uh, different studies which have supported this, uh, this, this result. And that difference was, in fact, uh, the same in the two subgroups I've already described to you. But for me, the most important outcome, as I've again tried to stress through this presentation, was the risk of severe asthma exacerbations. And in the patients treated with tibutylene or the Saba as their only treatment, a severe exacerbation occurred in uh, 0.2 uh, per year, which is about 20% of the patient population. And that risk was reduced by just switching the reliever from the Saba to an ICS Laba to 0.07, or about 7% of the population, and was 0.09 with the, uh, with the maintenance inhaled corticosteroid. Now, we did also have a category of exacerbations called a moderate exacerbation. These were exacerbations that uh, required an increase in treatment, usually the increasing doses of inhaled steroids, for at least a two to three week period. And those occurred, moderate or severe, occurred in uh, 0.36 uh, per patient per year, or about 36% of patients, uh, reduced to 0.14 and 0.15. With the, uh, with the other two treatment options. To remind you with Sigma-2, and this is a summary of the result of Sigma-2, where the primary outcome variable was indeed severe exacerbations, there was no tibutylene arm or no Saba only arm, and the, the rate of exacerbation was 0.11 with as needed budesonide for motorol and 0.12 with maintenance budesonide. And again, no major difference when you just look within the study at the two subgroup of patients. 
Now in asthma studies, we also measure other outcome variables such as lung function. So this is the change in the FEV1 um, and measured from baseline over the one year of the study. And this slide and the next slide will look very similar and where the uh, Saba only arm is in the blue line and you see no change in the FEV1 over the one year of study. The maintenance budesonide or the maintenance inhaled steroid is shown in the purple line. You see there's about 120 ml improvement uh, over, the, uh, over the one year of study. And the combination of the ICS uh, and LABA is in red in the middle. And so the best outcome was with the maintenance steroid, the least good outcome with the as needed SABA and the as needed ICS LABA was in the middle. Now these differences were not large, uh, about 50 mLs either way. Uh, so clinically uh, not terribly important, but because of the size of the study, highly significant, highly statistically significant. We measured asthma control using the asthma control questionnaire, again, changed from baseline. The uh, Saba only in blue had the least good effect, the, I, the maintenance steroid, the best effect, and the ics lava combination as reliever was in the middle. Again, these differences were about 100, uh, sorry, 0.15 uh, either way. And these are way below the, the minimally clinically important difference, which for this measurement is 0 0.5. So highly significant, clinically not terribly important. But the reduced risk of an exacerbation that was achieved with the as needed budesonide for motorol, which was in fact the same as the maintenance budesonide in sigma one and in sigma two, this benefit was achieved with an 85% reduction in the amount of inhaled steroid needed. And that's because mean adherence during the study was 79% with the twice daily reminders sent to patients. We measured every actuation of the device that was measured electronically. So we knew uh, how often it was taken and the time of day it was taken. So these measurements are actually very precise. And similarly in Sigma two, there was a 75% reduction in the total dose of steroid needed uh, uh, because the mean adherence was a little bit lower without the twice daily reminders at 64%. Now, uh, Eric Bateman, one of my colleagues involved in these studies has just recently had a paper accepted uh, where a subgroup analysis was done uh, in firstly the Sigma-1 trial, which as I've stressed before, was the study that contained the as needed Saba as one of the treatment arms. And this is the previous result I've shown you with the reduction in exacerbation risk. And when subgroup one was analyzed, there was uh, first of all, a lower risk of an exacerbation in the Saba only arm compared to the subgroup two, suggesting these were indeed a slightly milder population entered into the study. And the, the difference in the uh, risk reduction between the maintenance budesonide and the as needed budesonide for motorol, it was lower, but not statistically so. But when the uh, uh, this analysis was done for the pooled population in the two studies. Uh, for the uh, overall effect, there was essentially identical results for the as needed budesonide from Otrol to the budesonide maintenance. But for subgroup one now, the risk reduction was significantly uh, lower in the uh, subgroup one, the milder, slightly milder population with as needed budesonide from Otrol compared to, uh, to maintenance budesonide suggesting that at least for this outcome, severe exacerbation risk reduction, there is indeed a small but significant benefit in using this approach rather than the, uh, the approach of, of, of requiring patients to use their inhaled steroids twice daily uh, to get this benefit. Now, subsequent to the two Sigma trials being reported in 2019, there was another study reported from Richard Beasley and a number of colleagues in, uh, in New Zealand, Australia, and Europe that essentially copied the design of the Sigma-1 trial, which had an albuterol or sal sal salbutamol uh, treatment arm, maintenance budesonide treatment arm, and budesonide fomoterol treatment arm. But this was an open label pragmatic study uh, where patients were randomized to treatment, but the treatment was known to the patient and to the, and to the uh, investigator. 
And for this outcome, the annualized exacerbation rate was the primary outcome. This included both moderate and severe exacerbation. So for this outcome, you'll remember the uh, exacerbation rate per patient per year in sigma-1 was 0.36. And in this study, it was 0.40, so essentially the same. And the benefit achieved with both maintenance budesonide and the budesonide from Oterol as reliever was almost identical to that seen in the uh, sigma-1 trial. However, what was different was when the number of severe exacerbations only was evaluated in the albuterol or salbutamol uh, subgroup or a treatment arm, I should say, it was 23. In the maintenance budesonide, it was 21. But in the budesonide from Oterol, it was significantly reduced to just nine patients having a severe exacerbation over one year. And I think the explanation for this is that because this is a pragmatic open label study where uh, adherence is not formally measured, that the patients in this treatment arm did what most patients do, which is they didn't use their maintenance inhaled steroids uh, as, as, as prescribed. And therefore the risk of an exacerbation was not terribly different to those only treated with the uh, Saba uh, uh, as the treatment. And so this is the evidence that this approach does work. But of course, important question is how does it work and what is the mechanism of this benefit? And this is a hypothesis that we've been working with that when patients develop an acute exacerbation of asthma, this develops over days. It doesn't happen quickly, usually three, five, seven days of gradually worsening symptoms. Patients are using more reliever medication because symptoms are increased. Exacerbation is identified, and then the patients are treated with oral corticosteroids, and it resolves over uh, seven to 10 days. When you use a reliever that has a steroid, the hypothesis is you're getting in with the steroid much, much earlier, and therefore, if this is an eosinophilic inflammation, you're reducing the inflammation, and the exacerbation does not develop into a full-blown event. And in the Sigma-1 study, we have the data to evaluate this hypothesis because both the number and the timing of the reliever medication use was measured as well as exacerbation risk. And so this analysis was done and just recently reported in the Lancet for Spiritual Medicine. But the first uh, thing to point out is that the median numbers of reliever medication use was quite infrequent. So for the ASNI tributylene, it was about one day uh, in three. For the ASNI budesonide from Oterol, about one day in four. And for the uh, maintenance budesonide, about one day in five. So these were mild patients who needed a reliever medication use not very frequently. And of course, there was a very skewed distribution of this use. So on more than 70% of days, patients didn't need any reliever medication use. And it was quite unusual for patients to need more than two inhalations on any day. But we asked the question, if you looked at these patients who use more than two or more than four or more than six or more than eight inhalations on any day, on the first time they did this, what was the associated risk of a severe exacerbation in the three weeks following this sentinel day? So is this increased use associated with an exacerbation and how frequently does that occur? And that's what's shown in the next two slides. Firstly, we have patients who used more than two as needed inhalations uh, on the first occasion. Tributylene, or it's, uh, the Saba is shown in blue, and this uh, severe exacerbation occurred in about 4% of patients who use a Saba more than two, uh, on more than two occasions. And for more than four occasions, that was increased to about 8% of patients having a severe exacerbation. And that was reduced to around 1% with when the reliever had a steroid uh, in both the as uh, uh, more than two or more than four inhalations on the first occasion. The effect is even more dramatic when we look at the more than six or more than eight inhalations on any day, where again, about eight to 9% of patients had a severe exacerbation um, uh, when the reliever was tributylene. And this is the number of events shown here uh, to give you some idea of the magnitude of this effect. And when the reliever had an inhaled steroid, the number of such events was many lower, as you can see, and the consequence is very different. So of more than 100 patients who had this occurred, more than six inhalations, 
one patient had a severe exacerbation. And when more than eight inhalations was delivered, it was zero. Of the 48 patients that ha had to do this on one occasion during the study, no patient had an exacerbation when the reliever had an inhaled steroid. And so I would argue that this is good evidence that getting in early with an inhaled steroid really does have a benefit in reducing exacerbation risk by getting the anti-inflammatory effect early as the exacerbation develops. Now I'm going to show you a slightly different summary slide of treatment recommendations um, for managing and reducing severe exacerbation risk. This is the GINA Global Initiative on Asthma Guideline. And I'm showing you this because this slide, uh, first of all, makes the point that the preferred reliever medication use for all patients with asthma is an as needed inhaled steroid uh, with famotidol. And the alternative reliever is for the use of a short acting beta agonist. So they've looked at this evidence and made the statement that this clearly shows benefit and improved efficacy when this approach is used. But also they make the point that for very severe patients who are uh, requiring a lot of treatment, uh, the additional benefit one can uh, achieve in reducing exacerbation risk is to add on a long acting antimuscarinic uh, to the combination of the ics lava because this does reduce exacerbation risk. And this has very recently been summarized by uh, Lisa Kim and Derek Chu from the Department of Medicine uh, here in Hamilton, published in JAMA just about two weeks ago, looking at a, a systematic review and meta-analysis of all the studies that you compared triple therapy. This is the ics lava plus a LAMA combination to dual therapy, showing the reduction in incidence rate of exacerbations, reducing the uh, time to first exacerbation. There's about a 15% uh, uh, risk reduction and also slightly improving asthma control, although this effect is small and probably clinically not terribly important. So for patients with more severe disease, this is now accepted as the treatment approach using triple therapy uh, before considering moving on to something else such as the use of a biologic uh, to manage these patients. So my final slide is to come back to where I started uh, to share with you, uh, I hope, the evidence that risk of exacerbation is a real and concerning uh, event in patients with asthma, no matter if they have mild, moderate, or severe disease, and that the evidence is now very compelling that using a reliever that contains an inhaled steroid does indeed provide additional benefit to just using a SABA. And so the, guy, the, the recommendation, treatment recommendations for can, the Canadian Thoracic Society, as well as the global uh, uh, recommendations are now putting this forward as the uh, preferred option. But there are some questions that still remain, some science, clinical science that still needs to be done. We don't have very much evidence in children under the age of 12 years. There's one study, a small study I didn't share with you today, the TREXA trial, which did show uh, uh, trend to benefit, but it was a very small study, not powered to look at exacerbations. So we don't yet have the evidence for this, although the studies are, I know, uh, underway. We don't have any evidence for the use of an ics lava combination in an acute care setting, such as the emergency room, where usually very high inhaled doses of SABA are given to manage the acute event in the emergency setting. And so that's another, I think, an important uh, outcome that needs to be evaluated. And finally, we don't yet have data on other inhaled corticosteroid beta agonist combinations other than the budesonide from Otrol one I've shown you. Uh, but again, these studies are underway. And I think in the next year or two, uh, there will be other options to consider uh, for using as a reliever uh, in patients with asthma. And so Dr. Crowther, dear colleagues, thank you for allowing me to share this with you today. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Paul. That's great um, and excellent and comprehensive uh, presentation. We do have a couple of questions in the question and answer box, but I'll, I'll address one first. So I, I think you said that we've known for 30 years that SABAs, as you called them, uh, are, are bad. And yet um, I would say that in my practice, I'm in clinic, I'll be seeing people this morning, a couple of people will, be on, will have asthma, they'll be on their blue inhaler and nothing else. I suppose we shouldn't be surprised since some ridiculous number of Americans still think that Trump won the election that, that we haven't been able to get real news out. But you know, that strikes me as dangerous. How, what's the strategy to 
get this news across since 30 years of doing rounds hasn't gotten the news out yet. <laughs> yeah, that is really the $64,000 question mark, how, how to get this change into, into real clinical practice. And I think the answer is very simple, time. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, uh, shall I put this uh, discreetly, older physicians, uh, I'm not including you in that, Mark, who have a, who have a pattern of practice, who, uh, who, who do this, and patients who have since their often early childhood. This has become the, the standard way they do it, and to try to re-educate them about the advantages of a different approach is sometimes very difficult. I think with the acceptance now by both uh, the recommendations I've shown you uh, which has just come about in the past year or two, that this will now become accepted as the best standard of practice and that uh, perhaps people starting out in their career managing asthma patients or patients newly diagnosed, this will be the approach uh, taken. I have, spent, I have spent endless hours trying to convince patients that this is a better one than this. And they nod and they smile and they're very polite, but I know as soon as they go outside the examining room, they'll revert to what they, they believe to be the, the, the best approach for them. So it is, is a real challenge. And they probably get immediate short-term relief that they can feel. Of course, so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, one, one strategy would be to enter into a discussion with the CMPA. I think people tend to pay attention to the CMPA handling. Yeah. So I think that's a, I think with the evidence you present, presented, if someone came into the eMERGE and died of asthma and they were only on a blue inhaler, there's probably a medical legal risk. Yes, absolutely. I, I just uh, go over some of the questions we have in the boxes here. So uh, Greg Kernew asks, how important is dealing with allergens versus just treating the inflammation with steroids and how can we do that part of the equation better? So allergen avoidance um, has been a topic of intense interest in asthma because of course the majority of patients with asthma, particularly milder disease, are allergic or have evidence of environmental allergen that can potentially drive their asthma. The problem is having effective ways of, of, of reducing exposure. And so studies, for example, of trying to um, minimize house dust mite uh, exposure, such as covering mattresses, washing uh, the bed clothing uh, every two weeks uh, in very hot cycle wash and so forth, have really not proven to be very effective because the, the intervention is not terribly effective. Um, and so uh, the one study that did show very clear benefit was a study reported years ago when you could do this kind of study, you could never do it now, when they took people with severe allergic asthma and kept them in a hospital room for two months and uh, where the hospital room was absolutely uh, sterile, no, no mite at all. And that study showed very clearly that all of the outcomes that we measure in asthma, lung function, airway responsiveness, all improved over that two month period. But that is just not practical. And so allergen avoidance, it's recommended, and some people are pretty good at doing it. But for example, the, maybe the best example is try and convince anybody to get rid of a cat. Now, cat is probably the most asthmogenic allergen I know of. Uh, it is viciously asthmogenic. And yet you try to convince a family to get rid of a family pet, it's virtually impossible. So, it, so you know, that is the challenge, convincing people that this is, in fact, the correct thing to do. Excellent, thanks. And probably 20% of the people in the hospital for two months got C. diff, so it's probably not a great intervention in any case. Greg also asked, I'll, the second question from Greg is, in patients with limited financial resources, what combination is most practical? Yeah, that's a good question. And one that we had to think about actually quite a bit, because one of the real advantages of a SABA, short acting beta agonist, it's very cheap. And in fact, in some countries, it's over the counter, not fortunately in Canada, but in Australia, for example, it's sold over the counter. Uh, when compared to using uh, a combination inhaler, which is it's cheap, but not as cheap. I mean, the, the treatment approach in this study uh, cost about 20 cents a day, if you actually do the math, uh, which is, you know, what's that, one-fifth or one-sixth of a cup of Tim Hortons coffee? So, you know, it's all, it's all relative to, to what you want to pay for the benefit. There was a, a formal cost-effectiveness study done associated with the SIGMA trial, which is one of those rare cost effectiveness studies which showed both improved benefit and reduced cost. Because keeping people out of hospital or keeping them in the workplace, avoiding exacerbations, is extremely cost effective. Ann Holbrook asks, uh, could you summarize the evidence as to whether or not leukotriene inhibitors have any useful role for important clinical outcomes in adults with asthma? 
Uh, and the, the evidence is uh, not strong for adults. It's a little better in children. Uh, I think that's probably because the most striking benefit for anti-leukotrienes are their effects against allergen-induced responses in the airway. Uh, by the way, a study that was first done here in Hamilton, uh, as well as uh, attenuating exercise bronchoconstriction. And for children, uh, stopping and using a blue puffer before they exercise is just totally impractical. They're out in the playground, they're running around, in and out, and so forth. So I think in children, uh, anti-leukotrienes, particularly actually as, as parents are so reluctant to use inhaled steroids in children, although all the studies, every single study has shown that even low-dose maintenance inhaled steroids is more effective than anti-leukotrienes. But as a treatment option, in the absence of willingness to use an inhaled steroid, in children, anti-leukotrienes are, are, I think, a reasonable option. Thanks. Um, and Greg, uh, Greg's asking lots of practical questions today. Home spirometry, what machines would you recommend? And how do people learn how to use it versus a peak flow meter? Yeah, so there are uh, electronic spirometers that are becoming more robust, more available and cheaper. They're still not cheap. And they're still not uh, quite as reliable as, say, the spirometers that Greg, you would use or I would use here in the hospital setting. I'm not going to suggest a particular make because honestly, I don't know which one is better than any other. Um, but they, they do have the advantage of uh, over peak flow measurements in that peak flow measurements are in, 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 uh, very effort dependent. So you really have to go up to total lung capacity and make a very firm forced effort to get your best peak flow. Uh, so measuring FEV1 is, is, is effort independent. Uh, and so people can be trained quite easily how to get a good and reliable measurement. And you, um, so I, 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 we all would rely much more on, on FEV1 measurements rather than peak flow. So these are more available, cheaper, and we're beginning to use them a little more in, in practice. Excellent. Alistair asks, so it seems the most practical strategy is to hijack the immediate gratification of SABA to deliver steroids. Are there longer acting inhaled steroids coming down the pipe that could be used in this combination? Yeah, good question, Alistair. Um, so there are inhaled corticosteroids that have that are longer lasting. Uh, uh, Fluticasone furorate is one that uh, uh, comes to mind that is used once daily only. Um, and uh, the, um, the combination of this plus a rapid onset beta or short uh, SABA or, uh, or a LABA, uh, a beta agonist, I'm certain is being studied somewhere because uh, as you know, pharmaceutical companies are very quick on the uptake and with, with this quality of evidence of benefit, lots and lots of companies are now developing their own combination with this steroid or, or that beta agonist. I don't think the steroid matters that much actually, which steroid. I think the only thing that really matters is that you get the steroid in and get it in at the right time. But what really does matter is you have a, a beta agonist that has a rapid onset of action and many beta agonists do not. A lot of the long acting beta agonists have a much slower onset of action and therefore cannot be used as a reliever medication. Lots of questions, so we will not get through on them all, just keeping an eye on the clock. But uh, Tony Kerrigan asked, when asthma is only exercise induced, what is the evidence for benefit of regular ICS versus as required? Uh, Tony, a great question. There is one study, uh, Lazarizas and colleagues published about 10 years ago that did that uh, comparison, looked at maintenance <clears throat> inhaled corticosteroids compared to uh, as needed Saba compared to the combination as needed. Uh, a small study uh, done in, in, uh, in Scandinavia, but clearly showed that maintenance inhaled steroids was much better than using uh, just the Saba as needed for exercise bronchoconstriction. And the combination as needed and used prior to exercise was just as good as the maintenance inhaled steroids. So yet again, uh, this combination is better than a Saba in protecting against exercise bronchoconstriction. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Dr. O'Byrne. We should end there just in the interest of getting everyone onto their day. So thanks very much for a great set of rounds, a real tour de force and 30 years of advances, which have advanced us a long way in science, but maybe not as far practically as we would like. Uh, just a reminder to everybody uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, physician in chief grand rounds will continue for the rest of June at both Hamilton Health Sciences and St. Joe's, and we'll return with CARES grand rounds in September. Um, our intention right now is to return with electronic only grand rounds with the hope of moving to hybrid rounds at some point. We've had great attendance at rounds um, this year, regularly exceeding several hundred people on. And uh, so we're going to continue with some form of hybrid rounds starting in the fall. So 
Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. O'Byrne for a tour de force presentation, and I won't be speaking with all of you as a group, uh, so I wish you all uh, a, the best possible summer we can extract from this year. Numbers are continuing to look very good. And we remember to encourage everyone to get vaccinated. Dr. O'Byrne was a vaccinator. I'll be sticking needles into people's arms this week. So encourage friends and family and everyone else to get out there and get vaccinated so we can get back to normal as quickly as possible. Uh, Paul, any last words? Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And I also share my very best wishes to everybody for hopefully some time off, some relaxation away from this madness uh, over the summer. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll speak to you later. Bye now.